I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Ryan Fisher with Camel Plan. I want to start by saying the Camel Plan does not give any investment advice, tax or legal. We <clears throat> strongly um, want you to work with your accountants and professionals before making any investment decisions. We're just a part of your team. Should you have any questions about how to use retirement accounts to make such investments as one of them that we'll show you today. We have special guest, uh, Kevin Michaels with Cross Properties. He's been in real estate for over 15 years. He's gonna give us a brief education on what he's been doing, why it works. He'll go over the pros, cons, what's needed, how it should work to maximize profits and minimize risk. So I'd like to welcome you, Kevin. Ryan, thank you. Good uh, afternoon. My name, as mentioned, is Kevin Michaels. I'm the co-founder of uh, Cross Properties. We are based in Philadelphia, and uh, we started the company in 2010. I'm trying to find the next slide here. Bear with me. Yep, you should be able to click in the bottom there. All right. Uh, so, uh, for us, culture is extremely important, uh, and I'm, I'm the chief culture officer, if you will. Uh, our why, our mission, uh, is to cultivate uh, environments where people can flourish. Uh, cultivate, uh, from, for us, from our perspective, is we're getting our hands dirty. Uh, we, uh, we tend to be deep value add uh, investors in real estate roll up the sleeves and, and unlock value. And uh, that word cultivation to us is, is meaningful. Environments, uh, we're in the space business uh, where people can flourish. We've defined those people as, uh, as our staff first, as our uh, residents second, and as our uh, investors third. Uh, our, our posit there is that uh, if we can love our, our staff, they'll take great care of uh, the people that live in our communities and that will pay uh, terrific dividends for uh, our investors. Kevin, I just also want to add to the audience, you're welcome to ask any questions in the chat box. We'll take those first, as many as we can before we run out of time. Okay. Our uh, company values uh, are, are sixfold, uh, the first two being the most uh, important, uh, the first being done. Uh, by that, I mean uh, a lot of our projects uh, have twists and turns. Uh, what's most important is that we get them uh, across the finish line. Uh, excuses are a dime a dozen. Uh, we know that we're going to have uh, hurdles to, to overcome, and uh, it's our uh, staff's primary challenge uh, to make sure that uh, the promises that we make uh, ultimately get fulfilled and uh, uh, we get we get it done. Uh, loyalty. Uh, by that we mean uh, you know there's teamwork element to this, but uh, at the end of the day we've got each other's back. They check the egos at the door, uh, and we make sure that uh, we're helping one another to to get things done. Uh, beauty. Um, we are passionate about uh, design, uh, and, and not necessarily. Uh, uh, at any and all costs. So we say uh, we choose beauty where possible. We are uh, certainly aware of, uh, of budgets, uh, but it's my goal to make sure that uh, the, the, the projects not only are profitable, that, uh, but they're attractive and, uh, and beautiful when we get done with them. Uh, curiosity, we're always looking for uh, uh, ways to build a, a better mousetrap and to uh, fine tune the organization um, and to continue to grow. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, courage. Uh, some of the projects that we take on are, uh, we'll call them audacious, uh, and uh, we are not afraid to step up to the plate uh, and swing. Uh, we'll talk about one, uh, one, a couple projects in particular where, um, where it took courage to to step up and to do what we did, and and uh, we'll uh, we'll share the details there. Uh, and at uh, the, finally, perhaps uh, uh, very importantly, is is our legacy. Uh, we uh, aim to, to leave things better than when we left behind. Uh, I guess everyone has a legacy. Our goal is to have a, a positive legacy. And uh, the places that we do business in Philadelphia and the region, we want to be invited back to time and time again. Uh, it's critically important that we're working with the local stakeholders, uh, hearing them out, uh, and making sure that, uh, again, we're leaving the place, with, we're leaving a, a legacy that's uh, positive so that we can go back and uh, do business there again. 
Uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, the I guess the folklore is that we started uh, the company in March of 2010 over a, a cup of soup at a Chinese restaurant. That is in fact uh, true, uh, and uh, yeah, we continue to uh, to grow since then. Uh, my role is uh, CEO and visionary. Uh, David, uh, my partner uh, Blumenfeld, is the uh, president and uh, he deals with day-to-day uh, -day operations. I deal with uh, setting the tone and the pace, the culture of the company and, and the general direction. Uh, David's been doing this since he was in diapers, um, you know, literally for 30 odd years. Uh, there's every facet of, of real estate that he's touched. He's also, my background's as a CPA, David's background is as a, uh, uh, an attorney. Uh, across the uh, chart there is uh, Capital Markets, which is the group that helps us uh, finance all of our projects. We've got two different divisions on the property management side, uh, one that focuses on our apartments, another one that focuses on our student housing. Uh, development construction, uh, we build all of our, uh, our, our own projects and rehab them. Uh, <clears throat> by that, I, I mean that we're either building them ourselves and we're the general contractor or we're hiring general contractors and we're overseeing them. Uh, depending on the, the size and scope of, of the project, we'll make that decision. But uh, a high level of oversight uh, with a deep bench of uh, experience to make sure that we uh, deliver these projects on time and on budget. Uh, of course, we have an accounting department uh, and then uh, admin. Um, <clears throat> our footprint is uh, downtown, University City, uh, and the main line. Uh, downtown, a couple projects that are mentioned there is uh, Icon, which was a, a big community that we did at 16, uh, 1616 Walnut, basically at the corner of 17th and Walnut, right off Rittenhouse Square. That was an adaptive reuse of an old uh, office building that we converted. We'll talk about that in a moment. 1530 Chestnut is at the corner of 16th and Chestnut, a beautiful old building that we converted from office to, uh, uh, to apartments. Uh, out in University City, we have uh, a few projects, uh, one called Good Food Flats, which was a marketing partnership with Drexel's uh, Food School, uh, Legacy of Palatin Villages in Palatin Village. Uh, those serve the needs of Drexel, Penn, and uh, University Sciences students. Uh, out on the main line, we've got uh, about six different communities that we have. Uh, the Palmers at City Ave in Lancaster, right in front of Lincoln Hospital. Uh, we're building a second phase uh, right now. Uh, those are both in Wynwood. Um, in Valley Kinwood, uh, we rezoned that town. We'll talk about it uh, to allow for what's called high density mixed use projects, which are essentially apartments over parking or apartments over retail or apartments over commercial. Uh, higher heights, typically uh, height limitations there are, are 60. Uh, and we've got three of those communities being built uh, as we speak. Uh, as well as the other one that we own uh, out in Ardmore, which is next to Suburban Square. Uh, all of those are along the main train line uh, with easy access to downtown, um, with uh, fantastic demographics, uh, great public and private schools, lots of access to transportation, high barrier to entry market, and, and a, uh, uh, a place that we've had uh, terrific success with. Uh, our integration is mentioned <clears throat> a little bit uh, in the York chart. Uh, acquisitions, we're always out there looking for deals. Uh, uh, capital markets helps us fund them. Development and construction helps us uh, build them. Property management, once they're built and uh, they're filled with tenants, uh, of course, we need to maintain and manage the property uh, and, of course, account for that uh, and share it with our uh, investors. So Nova is... Uh, is where we're spending a fair amount of time right now. Uh, this stands uh, short for North Bala. Uh, I'm on the board of the City Avenue Special Services District, which goes from the Schuylkill to St. Joe's. Uh, and it's a coordinated effort between Philadelphia County and uh, Lower Marion Township. Uh, it is a, a border street, it's a commercial district, and you've got two different townships that, uh, that butt up against each other. And, the intent of the special agency is to make sure that we're coordinating our policies, our politics, uh, our policing, our, our city and streetscape uh, improvements, traffic, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, part of uh, being part of that board, uh, we upzone that area to allow for what's called uh, high density mixed use projects. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, typically in this case could be as high as you know 10 stories, but it's a mixture of uses and it's putting a lot more on a smaller parcel 
and that's typically done in densely populated areas uh, where land is is scarce uh, and the attraction to be in the area is high. Uh, so rather than having an urban sprawl, uh, they increase the density and are allowed to do more stuff in a in a smaller area. So in the case of the City Avenue, uh, you know, if we want to compete with the King of Prussia's of the world and the Navy Yards uh, and and so forth, where uh, those are high density areas. Uh, to make sure that the Bala office market continues to thrive and be a, a potential destination for existing businesses and new businesses, um, uh, we upzone that area to uh, to continue to uh, to do well. Uh, in addition to that, what we uh, upzone was Bala Avenue, the downtown Bala Kinwood uh, along Bala Avenue. Uh, used to be uh, alive and vibrant, uh, and unfortunately, over the decades, has fallen into disrepair. Uh, so you've got a lot of retail that's uh, gone out of business, uh, and a, a mixture of, of landlords that uh, haven't served the town well. Uh, we upzone that area to allow for high-density mixed-use projects. And once that was put in place, uh, we, Cross Properties, ran in and bought 20 separate properties, uh, merged them into three separate uh, communities, uh, the first of which is uh, the Kelly, uh, the second is the Grant, and the third is uh, the Mayor. Uh, what are we doing differently? Um, you know, our, our term there is, uh, or coined, is, is small town reimagined. So we literally hired uh, somebody to be our full-time uh, ambassador. You can call him the mayor of the area uh, that is charged with community outreach, working with uh, groups like uh, the Bella Kinwood Neighborhood Club, uh, the Kinwood Heritage Trail, um, a lot of the different uh, corporations that are, are nearby, the local churches and synagogues and so forth, to say, hey, there's a new sheriff in town. We're bringing fresh ideas, fresh energy, uh, fresh capital. Uh, and similar to downtown Westchester, Phoenixville, Media, Wayne, these are areas that have been revitalized, that are fun places to go visit, to eat, to, to shop, uh, and, uh, you know, for both grown-ups and, and uh, children. And Bala once had that, and we're bringing it back. Uh, over the last 12-plus uh, months, we've had block parties, kosher and vegan markets. We've had cornhole tournaments, holiday parties, and so forth. And uh, our best estimate is bringing out about 10,000 people that haven't visited there in, in quite some time over the last 12 months uh, and have gotten an extremely uh, strong uh, positive response uh, from attendees saying, we're very excited, we stand and support you, uh, and we look forward to you guys finishing these projects so that, uh, uh, so that you know, Bala can be revitalized. Um, this is what it uh, looks like currently. That Bala Avenue is, is uh, I don't know what that shape is, but uh, a curve, curvilinear, if you will. Uh, and it uh, it's, stands between Montgomery Avenue uh, on the one side, and I guess that's the north side, and the south side is, is City Avenue. Um, top right there is 10 Union, uh, uh, is the address. It's now known as the Kelly. This is 109 apartments. Uh, we delivered this about 90 days ago. We're about 40% leased right now. Uh, really attractive demographics from an investor standpoint. Uh, folks that can afford to, to live just about anywhere and uh, have chosen to, to, to live and live in our communities and also to rent versus buy. Uh, the, the macro trends that are happening in the, in, uh, the country is that uh, the baby boomers, which uh, I believe is about 75 million folks, uh, are selling the big homes. Uh, their kids have, have left uh, on for college or beyond, uh, and they no longer want to cut grass, uh, shovel snow, uh, and deal with the maintenance of a large home. So they're choosing to, uh, to sell, to downsize. Uh, they're doing it either staying on the main line or perhaps moving into uh, downtown. Um, and, uh, uh, and they're, you know, so they've chosen to, to move into our uh, new community. Uh, the second one across the street is called uh, the Grant. This one's under construction and uh, will be delivered in uh, April or May. Uh, roughly 70 units and 7,000 square feet of what we intend to do is co-working space. Uh, and lastly, the mayor is uh, is now uh, scheduled as 90 apartments, uh, and this will have uh, 10,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor, so six to eight restaurants and bars, bought a liquor license in Lower Marion Township, 
um, and we look forward to uh, starting construction on that one. So all in, uh, this is about 275 apartments, uh, 10,000 square feet of retail, 7,000 square feet of commercial space, and over $125 million that we're investing into downtown Ballot to, to bring it back, to revitalize it. And, and what we've been is kind of the whale in this area. Now there's barnacles coming on to attach to us, which is what we hoped. You know, we begin the momentum and, and have the smaller developers come in uh, and attach themselves to us and, and continue the, the momentum that we've begun. Uh, these are some uh, uh, sample pictures of what the Kelly looks like, the interior finishes and so forth. Um, the grand, these are images of uh, on the right hand side there of, of what that will look like and on the bottom left is uh, uh, design boards uh, that inspire us that we intend to uh, incorporate into the design of the interiors. Uh, these are uh, images of the mayor which uh, uh, which we're starting here construction uh, in the next 30 days. Uh, there are buildings there on the right-hand side that will come down. That building on the left-hand side is uh, historic, and uh, and we'll graph that into new construction. Uh, so on the right-hand side, again, design boards on um, uh, what the uh, finishes will look like. Um, moving along, uh, as I mentioned earlier, ICON was a project uh, that. Uh, we bought 1616 Walnut. It was roughly a 250,000 square feet, 25-story uh, office building. Uh, originally, this was the headquarters for Sun Oil, uh, Sunoco. Uh, uh, the Pew family were the founders of that. And on the top of the building, they had uh, their corporate offices. And Mr. Pew had, in fact, an apartment on the on the very top of uh, of the building. Uh, over the years, it turned from a Class A office to a Class B. B minus C plus office. Uh, and when we purchased it in 2012, there was a fair amount of uh, vacancy in, in the submarket <clears throat> for this type of space. And our and our position was, uh, we believe that that uh, these tenants can leave the building and go find a less expensive rent. We'll give them some money for their uh, you know for the hassle and called up the other landlords in town to say, hey, how would you like 250,000 square feet of office? And of course, they they gobbled it up quickly. So the tenants won because they ultimately got to lower the rent. We gave them a check to to leave the building, and the other landlords gave them a check to to move into that building. And uh, the arbitrage there was that there was excess uh, supply in uh, similar office space, and there was excess demand uh, on the residential side for Class A residential, which, quite frankly, uh, near uh, well, uh, near Rittenhouse Square. Hard to believe that there wasn't any Class A office uh, property to speak of. So uh, we bought the building. Uh, we replaced 1,400 windows. We did get it historically certified. Uh, so it is now on the National Register of Historic Places. The reason why that's important is when we do the renovation, uh, all the hard costs and some of the soft costs, the essentially the, the construction costs that we put into the property uh, generates a federal tax credit. In this case, that tax credit was worth about eight, $18 million. Uh, we sold that to PNC Bank. PNC Bank gets to shelter uh, some of their income. Uh, we preserve a, uh, a, a piece of history and lowers our equity requirement. Uh, and of course, rather than tearing this building down and throwing it into a landfill, uh, we deliver a, a one-of-a-kind, a beautifully restored uh, residential property. The, the windows were important because it, there was a lot of them and quite frankly, it was the largest line item in the budget. Uh, the mechanicals of the building uh, all had to be removed. This is a, a picture of what the basement looked like when we uh, dumped it all there. And it's important because you know we, we buy a lot of trash and turn it into treasure. And this shows uh, sort of the, the, the patient on the operating table uh, with its guts hanging out uh, that we ultimately turned into a diamond in the rough. Uh, again, images of uh, the de de destruction, deconstruction uh, of the property. Uh, further images. Uh, in this case, um, I, uh, interestingly, I mean, this this uh, chase there, which is that metal metal pipe, essentially was the spine of the company, uh, spine of the uh, building uh, that brings in all of your mechanicals and electrical and plumbing and so forth. Uh, and that piece of metal there probably hasn't been seen by anyone in 90 years. The building was built uh, in the mid-1920s, uh, mid 
uh, and during our reconstructive surgery, uh, obviously these are the types of things that we've exposed that uh, haven't been exposed in many, many decades. Uh, so the restoration begins. Uh, all the metal work that was on, on the interior and exterior of the building had to be lovingly uh, restored. If you look on the bottom right there, you can see them stripping everything back to uh, just the metal finish, uh, and then ultimately on the you know above that, the top left, and so forth, uh, the stain is reapplied uh, and sealed, and uh, really brought back uh, to, to life. Uh, again, it was an office building. We, we pulled all that stuff out, and now they're reframing it to be uh, a residential building. Finished product. Uh, this used to be Mr. Pugh's uh, living room, uh, and um, that, that herringbone flooring was uh, covered up with a tile and multiple levels of uh, glue and carpeting. It was a eureka moment when we discovered that it was under there. And uh, once, of course, we did, we pulled all that off and, and refurnished, refinished uh, the flooring as well as all the, uh, the wall uh, uh, woodwork that, uh, that you see there. Uh, roof deck, uh, again, there was an existing roof deck, but it certainly wasn't in uh, great shape. Uh, we brought that back to life, added the pergola for some privacy and some sun cover. Uh, this is a standard apartment that, uh, that's furnished there. Uh, you'll see the tile backsplash, uh, undermount sink, uh, granite countertops, uh, engineered wood flooring, uh, lots of light. Uh, this unit, about a thousand square foot, two bedroom, two bath, would rent for about $3,600 a month, which when we delivered it was a really top tier rent. Uh, again, this is a uh, roof tech uh, common area. Anybody that lives there has access to these and can use them freely. Uh, also, this can be used for private parties if they want to rent it, uh, they can for a, a fee. Um, so, digging into uh, some numbers a, a little bit uh, on a particular deal called uh, the Kelly, uh, which was the first of the three projects in Ballot Kinwood. Uh, I'll, I'll define a few terms here before we dig into that. Net operating income, or NOI, is essentially the uh, net income of, of the property. So, we collect rent. Um, parking fees, laundry, pet rent, um, we pay bills, uh, we pay our mortgage, and, and then we distribute free cash flow. So the net operating income is our effective gross income, which is all those rental income receipts uh, minus operating expenses. Operating expenses include uh, anything to run and maintain the property, uh, property taxes, uh, staffing, repair costs, insurance, uh, property management fees, legal, uh, some small utility costs, and so forth. Um, so income less expenses equals net operating income. Uh, that's before we pay uh, the mortgage, the debt on the property. Uh, and then after that is what's called free cash flow. Uh, cash on cash. So the free cash flow divided by your initial investment. So let's say, for example, you invested $100,000 into a particular deal. And the free cash flow on that property after collecting rent, paying operating expenses, paying the mortgage was a million dollars. Your cash on cash return would be $100,000 divided by uh, the million dollars uh, would be uh, 10%. Um, internal rate of return uh, or IRR is essentially your compounded annual return. So if you put in a dollar today and it turned into $3 10 years from now, um, that uh, calculation uh, is what's called the internal rate of return, that compounded annual return. Uh, what we target for our investments tends to be a 15 plus uh, percent IRR. Uh, so from the day you put your money into the deal to the day you exit, uh, our goal is to uh, achieve about a 15 plus percent, we'll call it 15%. Uh, net return to our investors compounded from, from the day they got into the deal. Uh, depreciation is a really tax uh, beneficial um, tool that's, that's out there for real estate owners to utilize. Uh, essentially, it's uh, getting paid uh, current for the wear and tear of the building. So most property is, uh, has a 30-year life. 
Uh, so if you bought a property for $30 million and divided by 30 years, uh, $1 million a year you could take against uh, uh, your uh, taxable income uh, on the tax returns uh, and essentially report a non-taxable uh, loss or a non-cash loss, excuse me. Um, so even though you may have had uh, cash flow, free cash flow and stuck cash in your pocket that particular year, you may be reporting a, a net loss uh, on your tax returns uh, for the property uh, based on uh, the depreciation. Uh, so this shows the, the budget for uh, the Kelly, uh, again, Project 1 in Val Kinwood. We, we assembled the land for $5.8 million. Uh, there's various other uh, acquisition costs there to get us to $6.5 million number. Uh, soft costs include architects, engineers, uh, development fee, uh, real estate taxes, insurance, construction manager to oversee the project for multiple years, uh, permits, uh, marketing, and so forth. Uh, is, is the soft cost. The soft cost tends to be for professionals and, and bodies, if you will. Total construction costs are the uh, gypsum board, screws, uh, flooring, lighting, you know, the hard costs of the, uh, of the hard construction costs, the material costs, plus related labor uh, to build the building. Uh, and the last are the uh, related financing costs to uh, pay a mortgage while you're uh, building this out. Uh, as well as various fees to the banks and so forth. So a total cost of roughly 41.3 million. Uh, on, the, on the left there is, is how that gets financed. 30 million of it came from uh, a loan with a local bank, uh, and the balance was from our investor group. Roughly $11.3 million was raised uh, by our, uh, from our investors uh, with, who would write us checks anywhere from 50K to a million dollars and everything in between. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, NOI. This is a little more detail on that. Gross residential income is essentially our rent. Uh, balcony premium, you know, if you have a balcony, you pay a couple extra dollars a month uh, for that privilege. Uh, you pay typically your first parking uh, uh, spot is free. Your second one, you'll have to pay a, uh, income on a uh, monthly basis for that. Uh, utilities, uh, we tend to separately meter everything to keep everyone honest. So if you live in unit 107, you get a uh, electric bill for unit 107. Um, and uh, we, you know, cross properties will pay the bill for the whole property. Uh, and then everything is separately sub meter. So uh, that shows the recuperation of those uh, utility costs. Storage income, we have, uh, you know, some folks sell big homes and they need a uh, place to store their stuff. So uh, we're able to charge a, a small a fee on a monthly basis for that privilege, uh, other income. Um, and then vacancy, we're typically running at a 5% vacancy. That's the national average and it's probably the, the local average as well. Um, and what that means is, you know, folks are coming and going through the property on a, on a semi-regular basis. Uh, and as somebody leaves, you might have a property that's down for a, uh, a unit that's down for a week or a couple of weeks or as much as a month. And that averages out to roughly 5% of your uh, income on an annual basis um, being shaved off just because of that uh, turnover. Ideally, uh, you know, the goal is not to get necessarily to get to 100%, believe it or not, because it usually means that you're priced uh, too low. So we try to find that, uh, that nexus between uh, maximum revenue and minimum vacancy. Uh, of course, on the expense side, we have salaries, we have uh, uh, costs to promote and advertise the property, uh, repairs and maintenance, stuff breaks down, we've got a reserve for it, contract services is, you know, people shoveling, cutting grasses, uh, and so forth, management fee for to cross properties to uh, oversee the day-to-day -day operations of uh, the company, those are on-site payroll uh, costs. Um, utilities, taxes, insurance, and so on and so forth. So in this case, 3.673 million is our total income. $929,000 is our expenses against the property. Net operating income, 2.744 million. Uh, and, and that little metric there on the bottom of uh, 41, uh, return on cost, 6.64%. That's an important number to us. This essentially says if you paid cash for this property of 41, 
$1.323 million, you'd get $2.7 million uh, of income against that, or roughly a 6.64% uh, return on your money on an annual basis. Why is that important? Because if we're going to go through all the headache and heartache of, of uh, buying a piece of dirt, getting it entitled and putting a property on it and filling up that property with warm bodies that, that pay rent, uh, we wanna make sure that we're getting uh, a risk adjusted premium compared to if we simply bought a building that was already built and full uh, with residents. So in that case, uh, currently the market is about a 5% return on uh, on those type of properties. That would be something that was delivered, let's say in the last 10 to 20 years, it's already been built, it's already been approved, it's filled up and it's already cash flowing. Uh, you know, on the one hand that earns you about a 5% a year. Uh, again, if you paid entirely cash for the property, uh, in this case, we're, or we're uh, delivering about a 6.64% uh, return. So we're getting about 1.64% uh, premium uh, for taking the risk of doing a development. Now, that doesn't tell the whole story because when you use leverage and the leverage uh, only costs you three or 4% a year, uh, that helps your, your free cash flow and it, and it you know, juices the returns, if you will, not only on an annual basis, but over the lifetime of the investment. Uh, this shows uh, the 10 year uh, projections for the Kelly. The first two years there, you'll see a lot of zeros. That's because we're building the property. Uh, in year three, the property has been built. Uh, it's now full. Uh, that gives us the opportunity to uh, go out to a bank and say, hey, we've created all this value. We'd like to pay off our construction loan and put in on long term uh, debt at a fixed rate. Uh, right now, on this particular property, we're locking 10-year uh, money at 3.75%, uh, which is about the cheapest we've seen in many, many moons. Uh, that allows us to uh, pull out uh, equity uh, as well and make that distribution to our investors. Uh, they still own their pro rata share of all free cash flow going forward until we dispose of the property. Um, so the goal here, again, is to create value uh, borrow against that value, lock in long-term interest rates, stabilize the property, and, and send distributions to our investors on a, on a quarterly basis. And at some point down the road when we sell it, whether it's in year five or seven or 10 or 15, uh, they own their pro rata share of the back-end profits uh, as well. Uh, I will note one thing there that says uh, on the bottom right, uh, year 10, cross-promote distribution, uh, so the split on the back end is $14.9 million to our investors, $9.7 million to, uh, to cross for all the headache and heartache of putting the deal together and taking the risk and so forth. And essentially, that's what's called a promote or a carried interest. So that's really what we are working hard for is to make sure that we have a profitable deal. Uh, and as long as we get our investors their money back plus in this case, an 8% uh, compounded preferred return from the day they get into the deal, uh, our investors are willing to split profits above that. And the better the deal does, the, the more cross participates uh, in the profits. So bottom left there, it says IRR on investment. Again, that's your compounded annual return of 18.2% net to the investor. If you compound 18.2% for 10 years, you'll get a multiple of your money of 2.68x. In other words, if you, if you put in $100,000, you would expect to get $268,000 uh, at the end of that 10-year uh, term. Uh, and that would be partially through current cash flow and partially through uh, appreciation of the property. That is uh, all I have for today, I am happy to take uh, questions. We're grateful for your time. We're out there, we're active. I think we're working on some uh, terrific projects. Camel Plan uh, has been uh, great uh, in supporting us. Uh, we have probably 150 investors. Uh, uh, I would say 30% uh, of them uh, use Camel Plan and, and some uh, similar folks to take uh, to activate their real estate excuse me, their retirement plans uh, and to invest it into real estate vehicles with folks like us. Thanks for your attention. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, a few quick questions. 
Uh, can anybody invest in this or do you have to be accredited? Uh, no, we, we, you do not have to be an accredited investor. Okay. <clears throat> and do you have a minimum? Uh, 50,000. Gotcha. I thought it was 50,000. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I appreciate the information. It's nice to see how that works. And if you guys do have any questions, feel free to get a hold of Jake uh, at Cross Properties, 267 256 9976. I can be reached at R Fisher, R F I S C H E R, at Camaplan, C A M A P L A N dot com. And phone is 215 283 2868. Appreciate you taking the time to um, give us this information today, Kevin. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Camaplan. Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Still there, Kevin? Yep. Um, that's fine with your screen. I can just let me just see another qu question just came in here. Another one. Great. Can you let me know how you're looking to stress test your numbers in case of recession on the market? Sure. Uh, I well, in in this case, the the, the Kelly is 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 fully baked. Uh, the project has been built. So I'll, I'll mention one thing. The uh, the risk that I see with any development deal uh, is you have to uh, build it uh, on time, you have to build it on budget, uh, you have to be able to lease it up for your income projections, you need to be able to operate it uh, with the operating ex expenses you need, uh, you're assuming. And then there's the capital markets, uh, as this uh, question's uh, coming up, uh, are interest rates going to go up or down and how does that factor into uh, to our model? Uh, so we do uh, stress test each one of those. Well, I will say the, the first two on the construction side is uh, ultimately we get what's called a gross maximum price, a GMP contract with the general contractor. So if they say the project's going to cost $10 million, we sign a contract that says it's going to cost $10 million. If it goes above that, uh, they're responsible for those costs. So uh, that's one way to mitigate the risks. On the income and expense side, uh, we've been doing this now for 15 years. We know this market and sub-market uh, extraordinarily well. We have similar product in the area, so we're very comfortable with the income uh, and expense side and our assumptions there. Uh, we, we do inflate not only the revenue, but also the, in, uh, the expense side. Uh, typically, our inflation uh, assessment or adjustment uh, assumption, excuse me, is uh, 25 to 3%. Um, and we certainly have seen that uh, over the years. Um, and then lastly, interest rates. Uh, we do believe that interest rates will trend uh, upward over time. We are factoring that into our assumptions uh, to the tune of 150 basis points or 1.5% uh, uh, rate increases is what we're assuming from the beginning of the project to the end of the project. Uh, and then lastly, uh, uh, what's called the capital rate, which is the exit uh, assumption. What 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 is the assumption that we have on the exit of the property and how it's valued? We'll take today's uh, valuation assessment, which is quite frankly uh, about a five percent, or roughly 20 times your net income, is what similar apartments are trading for today, and we will uh, adjust that to assume that that valuation metric is going to uh, change over time. So in a 10-year scenario, uh, we'll add another 1.5% uh, or essentially we're exiting at a 6.5% uh, capitalization rate uh, or roughly 16 times uh, net operating income versus 20 times today. So in other words, as interest rates go up, the valuation on the apartment communities uh, will will uh, not be as robust as they are today, and we do uh, take that into account as well. So, I guess uh, what I'd summarize is saying uh, we we've done a lot of these. Uh, we are, uh, you know, certainly cautiously optimistic of the uh, of the uh, market and the apartment space, uh, but we are also aware that there are cycles, uh, and we do our best. 
to be relatively conservative in our underwriting and also to factor in uh, various things, uh, interest rates rising, price rising, labor rising, and so forth, uh, that could ding value and to factor that into our, our modeling scenarios. I have two more questions for you there, Kevin, and then we'll um, <clears throat> end this. But uh, And this may be a more offline one so that you can give them more details because you have multiple projects. But what projects are you looking for investors for? Uh, the third project in Bella Kinwood, so the first two are fully financed. Uh, the first one we raised $12 million with friends and family. That's called the Kelly. That was 109 apartments. The second project called the Grant, 70 apartments. We raised uh, $8 million with our investors. Uh, that's fully financed. The third project we're just starting construction on right now. We're raising $10 million. We have uh, $3 million, uh, excuse me, $4 million uh, funded, committed right now. So we're out there. Uh, raising approximately six million dollars and yes we'd be happy to talk offline with anyone that has interest in uh, potentially reviewing that one that one will be 90 apartments and 10,000 square feet of uh, retail okay great uh well i appreciate it and encourage everybody to contact um jake over at cost properties to get more details on this thanks for taking the time uh to be with us and we look forward to uh seeing you again Thank you. Thank you.